Hello, welcome back to the Jet Press Podcast. My name is Justin Freed, and I'm joined as always by my man, Mike Luciano. Mike, I'm feeling good because my Wi-Fi is finally fixed, and I'm very excited about that. But Mike, how are you doing today on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon? I'm doing okay despite the nonstop construction that has been going on in the room directly above my apartment. So that has been nice for the last right. couple of days. It's even nicer not only to hear drilling and sawing and all that, but I looked out my window and there was a giant pile of just a destroyed, almost like a kitchen set, just pieces of wood strewn about. So I had to hear that getting dropped nice. out of the window from really high for an hour. So it's been a very noisy day right now. So. Let's try and calm it down by talking nonstop for an hour about the New York Jets. Uh, this is going to be a draft-heavy episode, folks, because I remember last year this was right when Aaron Rodgers got traded and there was leverage talk and DeAndre Hopkins, and it was kind of an unusual pre-draft process for the Jets. We didn't even know what picks they would end up having. We thought they would have 13 for the longest time, and they went down to 15. But now we can just fully go into draft talk. Jets have the number 10 pick. They have a promising third-round pick, too. I mean, this is a big draft. For the Jets. So before we get into what we want to do with the number 10 pick and el- and elsewhere, you can always find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, wherever you get your podcasts. We are on all those sites. YouTube at the Jet Press. If you want to support the show just by subscribing or just by liking the stream, because both of those things are really big helps, that would be a great way to show your support. Same with leaving a good review on Apple Podcasts. That's a good way to show support. But never mind all that, Justin. Let's get into Draft talk, specifically the number 10 pick, because the Jets are a contender this year, and it's very rare that contenders have top 10 picks in what is a pretty strong draft, especially offensively. I mean, this is this is a draft to need an offensive lineman or a wide receiver or a pass catcher. This is the draft for that, so the Jets kind of lucked out there. The Jets could go in so many different ways with this number 10 pick. I know certain picks that we'll get into the picks that have been kind of gaining momentum and it looks like it's going to be one of these two or three players. We'll get into that, but the flexibility that the Jets have right now to move up, to move down, to stay where they are, it's it's really unprecedented because the Jets have not had a pick this good and been this good in a very long time. So what we did before the show is we kind of looked at what we would want to have happen, our, our big board of options kind of, our big board of players of who we want at number 10. Of course, obviously, is chewing names like Marvin Harrison Jr. because there's no chance in hell he lasts to number 10. So eschewing that or any of the top quarterbacks, you know, May, Daniels, Caleb Williams, eschewing that, I'm looking at number 10, and I got five players, okay, five, that I think would be pretty home run picks for the Jets. Uh, even though number five, we'll get into him, number five is a little bit of a reach, but I just really like him as a prospect. He is an offensive lineman, so if those of you who want a lineman, you could finally quiet down because the Jets are finally going to get an offensive lineman. It is Troy Fatanu of Washington. That is my number five on the Jets' big board because Fatanu for is, is kind of a late riser. Now, uh, he was kind of like a fringe first-round pick for the longest time, and now he's kind of muscling his way into the even OT2 uh, yeah. debate because Joe Walt is he's going top 10. He's he's going to be gone. Beyond that, it looked like it was going to be Olu Fashano and Taliesi Fuaga fighting it out for the number two spot. That's not really the case anymore. J.C. Latham is really gaining momentum. Amarius Mims, the whole potential of Amarius Mims, even though he's only started eight games in college, that could get him picked pretty high. And now Fatanu, who is a very experienced tackle. They thought he was going to be a guard originally because they didn't love his measurements, but then he measured it at the combine, hit all the tackle thresholds, and boom, he's a tackle. He's maybe the most Robert Sala tackle in this class. Him and Fuaga are the most Robert Sala guys because they just play mean and nasty and aggressive, sometimes a bit too over-aggressive. That's Fatanu's problem where sometimes he can overextend and get in bad positions. But other than that, I mean, that's something you can work on for an offensive tackle. In terms of his tape at Washington, which meant going up against a lot of NFL edge rushers, you know, Brandon Dorless over at Oregon, Jonah Ellis over at Utah, handled him pretty well. USC has some top recruits like Corey Foreman. Like, he handled him pretty well, as well as anybody did. Faton is kind of in the mid-teens, kind of early 20s right now. But if the Jets took him at 10, it might be a slight reach, but... I, not in my eyes, especially if you want to tackle and they had him graded higher than like a Fuaga or Fashanu, I'd be I'd be thrilled if they got Fatanu. 
if they trade back and get him, if they move to like 15 or 16 and get him, home run first round for Joe Douglas. I learned today that I believe it's his name is actually pronounced Troy Fautanu, Fautanu or something. Fautanu? Like that. Fautanu, at least according to Dane Brugler's pronunciation guide. I don't know. That's it says Fautanu. Okay, we'll, we'll go and splice that pronunciation in yeah. later in, in editing. I I mean I I didn't I didn't even know how to pronounce Fuaga for Taliasi Fuaga for a while, but yeah, Fa, Fautanu. That's going to take a lot of getting used to. Is definitely one of the late risers in in this class, and I think I'm a little higher on you or on him than than even you are. I'd love if the Jets took him at ten, and I'm I'm in the camp at this point. That's like it's a toss up between him and Fashanu for me in a lot of ways, mostly because I just love Fautanu's versatility. He's someone who not only do you draft and hope that maybe he can be your future left tackle, but Am I crazy to say if you draft him, he's competing for your starting left guard job week one? I don't think that's a crazy guard? thing to say. I don't think that's a crazy thing to say. He played some left guard in Washington. He's a lot of teams have projected him as a left guard. Obviously, you don't want another Elijah Barrett Tucker situation where you're bouncing him around between uh, you know, different positions, but I believe that he's somebody that absolutely can start a guard from day one in the NFL. He can start a tackle from day one in the NFL. It's probably I, not. I guess maybe yeah. you don't want to just repeat an Elijah Barrett Tucker bouncing him around everywhere thing is the but look, man, Jets are trying to compete this year. They're trying to contend for a Super Bowl. You want to, and I, it's such an overused idiom at this point, but you want your best five out there. And if he's one of your best five starting offensive linemen, you want him in the starting lineup. And, and I think he's somebody that absolutely can compete for that left guard job. He's, like you said, a, a, a I think I think a good word to describe his tape is like violent. He's a finisher. He is mean. He's nasty. But also, I think he held up really well in pass protection for a guy that doesn't have like the ideal length that you'd want from a left tackle. He's a great athlete, and that definitely helps. I can absolutely see him sticking a tackle in the NFL. I know some teams have projected him as a guard, but I think in this pre-draft process, he's proved that he can play tackle. Uh, I put him, so the way I did my draft board is, you know, I, I explained this to you before the show, Mike, I kind of didn't do like players. I did my preferences like, oh, they could trade down and do this, trade up and do this. So Fautanu would kind of fit in my like third preferred option, which was uh, stay put and draft one of these guys, whether it's Latham, Fuaga, Fautanu, even Fashanu, if he gets to 10. I'd be very happy if the Jets stayed put at 10 and drafted him. You could also say, look, if he's available at like 15, 16, and you have an option to, to trade down to that spot, it's going to depend on if there's any team that's willing to move up. But absolutely, he's someone you can consider at that point in the draft, whether it's at 10, whether it's at 15. I'm not sure he's going to even get to 20 at this point. But, yeah, I, I think he's a really, really good prospect, and I'd be very happy with Troy, Fa or with Troy Fautanu at, at this point in the draft. The thing about Fao Tanu, too, and maybe this is why I have him ranked a little bit higher than some of the other ones. Like, I'm willing to work with a guy. I know Keith Carter is not a good coach, and the fact he's employed as an offensive line coach for this Jets team is kind of stunning. But mm -hmm. I'm always willing to take a chance on guys that have like minor, not minor technical flaws, but their athletic gifts kind of overpace where they are technically right now because you can teach proper footwork, you could teach good hand placement. You could teach not overextending. You can't really teach being as big as he is and as fast as he is. Yep. I think that's where Fatanu kind of, uh, kind of stands out here. Now he's, he might be a reach to some. I know every mile Kuyper's big board is going to have him in the twenties and the jets are going to go, Oh my God, you, we took a reach here. Like, don't subscribe to that. Go watch Washington's tape. He's pretty good. And the reason I know he's pretty good is because I first really caught on to him when I was uh, when I was watching Roma Dunze, who we'll get to later. Yeah. But if the, if the Jets want to take a wide receiver, they need to operate under the assumption that a Dunze is not going to be there because he might. I think it'll just be very hard because with the Cardinals needing a receiver, unless if they don't trade out, if the Cardinals stay at four, which I think they will, and take Harrison. The Chargers need a receiver, guy like the Leak Neighbors, and then Atlanta, the Bears maybe a team who moves up. Like there's a lot of receiver needy teams in the top 10. So because of that, I think the Jets might need to go and look at wide receiver four, which is Brian Thomas Jr. also of LSU. And I really am confused as to why he's not like a runaway wide receiver four. Like to me, he is. I'm just not seeing it in the wider draft media. I'm seeing a lot of 25, 26. I feel like everybody has him going to Buffalo for some reason, but this guy, I mean, what more do you want from an athletic perspective? He's 6'3", 210. He ran a legit 4'3", 340 at the Combine. 
In terms of relative athletic score, RAS, I mean, that was a better workout than Xavier Worthy, who yeah. took the 40 yard dash record. But to run a 4 3 3 at that size is incredibly impressive. Now, I know he ran a very limited route tree. I don't want to call it like a Mickey Mouse offense because there are a couple Mickey Mouse offenses in college football. Mm -hmm. The Ole Miss with Lane Kiffin, Tennessee, Baylor when Bryce Petty was there and Arp Riles was there. Like those are Mickey Mouse offenses where you're not reading the field like an NFL quarterback. It's basically just at, at this point, two seconds after you get the snap, this guy's going to be there, throw it to that area. It's not, that's not how you operate in the pros. LSU is not really like, it's got some tendencies and some like concepts that are kind of like that, but, and that limited Thomas's route tree. So that's the, that's the number one issue. And then of course the number two is, well, he had Malik neighbors on the other side. So we never got double covered. And he had Jane Daniels Heisman winner, number two, number three, overall pick throwing him the ball. So of course he's got good numbers. I think he had 17 touchdowns or something crazy during his last year, but if you just take all that out of it and just look physically, this is a big, strong guy, great hands, great speed, vertically downfield. He's one of the best guys at tracking the ball. I think him and Adunze are the best two in that one particular area in the draft. And then when you get him the ball early on, like he, he's got a little wiggle. He's not going to be, you know, a Debo Samuel kind of guy, but he can make some plays. He certainly can make some plays. I would be very happy if the Jets took Thomas at 10 if all three of them are off the board. I'm really bullish on his potential, and I think he just fits what they need, especially if Mike Williams doesn't pan out. Let's say Mike Williams is either washed because of the injuries or he gets hurt again. Well, then now you got a guy who I think stylistically is a pretty good replacement. He's not like as physical. Like Mike Williams is probably a little bigger, mm. but that's as good of a replacement as you're going to find in this draft if, God forbid, something happens to Mike Williams. So that's why I really love the Thomas pick. I'd like to preface this by saying that I there out of all like the real like, all the realistic options that the Jets could possibly go at ten and in, in even if they trade down outside of like drafting Dallas Turner or whatever, I'm pretty happy with whatever the Jets end up doing. I don't dislike any of the reasonable prospects at that stage, including Brian Thomas. I'm not as high on him as you. In fact, I don't know if it's a hot take. I don't think there's a huge gap between him and Lad McConkey. I know we mentioned it before the show, and I, I think that you disagree with that statement. I, uh, I think you're like, are you like related to Lad McConkey? I'm a like dude. He's my guy. What? He's my guy. I said it back in January. I think he's one of my guys in this class. I think he's an awesome player, and I think I don't think he's pro I don't think he's going to go day one. Although there's a chance, but he should. Like I think he's a day one player on my board. Uh, I haven't made a board as you have, but I, I, I think he's a really, really good player. And Brian Thomas. The issues to me aren't necessarily with what he can be in the NFL because I think he has all the potential to be an all-pro player. I think in, from, a, from a physical standpoint, from a production standpoint, what he did in college, he absolutely can be that level of – that caliber of player. Like maybe like even like a T. Higgins, almost a faster T. Higgins. Um, maybe he needs to bulk up a little bit more for that because I think he doesn't play quite as strong as T. Higgins does at points, but I, I can see that comparison. The issues with me are kind of stuff that you pointed out. The limited route tree – uh, I feel like you ran a lot of a lot of crossers, a lot of vertical routes for sure. Which that you know, it's it, it comes with the territory. They they had such a stacked skill position group. He was playing opposite Malik Neighbors. They didn't need him to run every single route under under the you know in the world. And it he was had a very Madney offense. It was a lot of deep posts yes. and verticals and over the middle. You could tell that all these young OCs who grew up playing Madden. You could tell it's a lot of those same routes. Yeah, and th and that's a red flag to me. It's not a red flag that oh, like I'm not going to draft this guy. But it's it's something to take into account. It's something to note. Uh, you know, as he as he goes into the NFL, I think he definitely benefited from his supporting cast. I also don't think. I mean, not that this is the be all end all for a player you're drafting at ten. I didn't love the effort he showed on on run blocking. I don't think he's a particularly strong blocker, and I think that is something that the Jets take into account. Probably why they were so high on Alan Lazard, aside from other reasons. Possibly why they were so high on Mike Williams because he is also a very good run blocker. I think that's something that they might you know take into account. Uh, with a guy like McConkey, I just think he's, and we'll, we'll probably talk about him a little bit later. I know I've talked about him a lot, but I might talk about him when we talk about our, uh, our day two guys that the Jets could target. But I think I'm just more confident that he's going to be able to consistently win and separate in the NFL than I am with Brian Thomas. But I say that while fully acknowledging dude is, is like, he has all pro potential. He's what is he? Six, two, two, 10, two, 15. Oh, yeah. And he ran a four, and he ran a four, three, three. Like, I mean, just doing that alone, and then he, he, he had like 1,700 yards in his last year at, at LSU, 17, or not 1,700 yards, like 1,400 yards, 17 touchdowns. 
dude, dude's got all the potential to be a, a great player. I just think there are some red flags that pop up with me and they just happen to be the red flags that I usually look for with, with receiver prospects, route tree and, and separation skills are, I think are the most translatable skills when it comes to wide receivers. And it's not to say that he can't do either of those things. I just didn't see him do it as consistently as other guys like Aladdin McConkey. I think I might still have Thomas over McConkey just because I think Thomas's upside is absolutely higher than Lad McConkey. But I think as far as like floor is concerned and in the safe prospect, I have more concerns about Thomas than I do McConkey. I guess I'm leaning on you could teach you run blocking is something you can teach and effort yeah. in is something you can certainly help with. And who would be a better blocker normally? It, like it, if they give the same effort, the six foot three guy who's 210 pounds or the six foot 185 when he's soaking wet guy. You're right. I, yeah, I, I, that's being hypocritical because Lad McConkey's not a great run blocker. I'm well aware of that. That's never. I would never call that a straight of his. A couple comments on McConkey here from the Facebook that's, chat. I want to get to uh, Gregory Free and McConkey won't separate in the NFL. Saying, "Did he do it at UGA?" I mean, Ooh, yes. Yeah. He's like one of the best separators in this entire class. Like, that, if that, that he, the thing. appeal of McConkey is that he can separate. The, yep. the reason I have more concerns about him is I just don't know how high his ceiling is. Because like good. he's a good athlete for his size, but at that size, there's a limited amount of stuff you could do with him. That's my concern. Everybody acknowledges he's a good separator. Yes, he was injury prone, as Gregory also says in chat, but that, that all goes into the evaluation. I'm pretty sure he's a top 50 pick even with the concerns. I think McConkey is going to be a really, really, really good wide receiver too in the NFL. That's that's what I think he's going to be. I'm not sure I see the wide receiver one ceiling with him, but if you're if you're telling me bank on somebody in this class, one receiver that's not like the top three guys to have a 10 year, 15 year NFL career as a reliable, productive player, it's Lad McConkey. Like that, that's why I'm so high on him. Keeping it on wide receivers because there is just I think of a, a slight miracle chance that this happens because there's always some debates about those fringe first round prospects and how good they're going to be. The top three receivers in this draft, Roma Dunze, Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr., in whatever or, order you want to put them in, typically it's Harrison, Neighbors, and Adunze. I don't know where Neighbors wide receiver one came from. That was really weird. Yeah. Like at no point was he wide receiver one, and then he just pops up like that. But That's how that's how the pre-draft, the pre-draft process is so weird, man. <laughs> that the, This whole Drake May thing, that's why he's going to go to the Patriots and screw us for no reason. Don't wish that. Don't wish that evil. Don't. Put it's gonna that. happen. Schefter pretty much said they're taking Daniels at two. The Commanders are. Brian Kelly said it too. Did you catch that? No, oh, I missed that. Now he was at his pro day, and uh, at you know LSU's pro day, Jaden Daniels and Thomas and neighbors, and they were asking about Daniels, and he goes, "Yeah, he's gonna go and be a great leader of the NFL, make some big plays for Washington." I did see that. I actually did see that. Yes. So the I Patriots gonna get May and screw us again. But beyond all that, I want to present this scenario to you. I think this could happen. Okay. So those two, those three go one, two, three. Harrison goes four. Neighbors goes five. JJ McCarthy goes six. Because I think for some reason, that's the pre draft process going crazy. The fact that JJ McCarthy is being regarded as a first round player, number one, and a top 10 player. Dude, he could go ahead of May. He absolutely could go ahead of May at this point. He shouldn't. <laughs> I agree. I 100% agree. You, my, my biggest red flag when you're talking about a quarterback is if the first the first like two things you're saying is oh he's a great leader like that's like every quote I've heard about McCarthy none of them have been football related right and that's that's such a red flag did you see the one there was one in Brugler's piece for crying out loud where it was like he came to Michigan and said if you just want to go play with girls don't come here and that's being a leader I'm like are we just making up right Zach Wilson honestly had a lot of that too. Yeah, Zach Come Wilson, on. like the, the thing about Zach Wilson, everyone's like, oh, you know, he's he's unshakable, like he's unflappable. He's, you know, he's a competitor. And <laughs> this guy got flapped more him. than anybody in the league. Right. His teammates love him. He's confident. And I'm like, that is not the Zach Wilson that I've seen the last couple of years. <laughs> this is he is so flappable, it's ridiculous. But so moving off that, now we're at number seven. Well, what do you know? The Titans take a guy like Joe Wall. No Roma Dunze yet. Then there's eight and nine, Atlanta, Chicago. What Atlanta says, you know what? Maybe we take the best defensive player available because we spent on Kirk Cousins. We got Drake London. We got Kyle Pitts. Let's beef up this defense. Now, Chicago at nine says the same thing because we got DJ Moore. We got Keenan Allen. Let's take like a Jared Verse at number nine. And then what do you know? Roma Dunze's there at 10. It might, it, it's unlikely, but I think there's a legitimate chance. And if a Dunze falls to 10, I legitimately feel like that that's like a no-brainer. 
in oh, terms of assuming Bowers is not there, because we'll get into Bowers later. But Odunze is just wow, is he a fantastic prospect? He might be honestly. I mean, Harrison's the safest, but outside of that, I think he's safer than neighbors. Tremendous hands, great route runner, good speed, great ball tracker. Mm -hmm. Like in most other years, he's wide receiver one running away. I feel he just happened to have the misfortune of coming out in a year with a guy who's been the best wide receiver prospect in 10 years in Marvin Harrison Jr. If he's half his dad, he's a good receiver, and he might be more than that looking at his profile. And then Malik Neighbors, who has crazy speed and tons of numbers and good route runner, like he kind of got screwed. But it could end up with him on the Jets, which I would be positively thrilled with. So much so that imagine that base offense of Carrot Wilson in the slot. Nuts. With Mike Williams and Roman Dunze. Don't don't ever say we didn't do nothing for you, Aaron Rodgers, because that's the best wide receiver core you may have had in over a decade. Dare I say that'd be the best wide receiver trio in the NFL, if healthy. If Mike Williams is healthy and playing at what he can do, I think that's the best wide receiver trio in the NFL. I'm not sure there's a trio that would that would top that. Uh, Roman Dunze is an incredible player. Like, he, he is an awesome prospect. I, I think I have him a step below Harrison and Neighbors, but it's just because I think Harrison and Neighbors are two of the best wide receiver prospects maybe I've ever seen legitimately. I just think they're unbelievable players. A Dunze, like you said, in a normal draft class is probably flirting with or the the consensus wide receiver one. It's crazy to and think last that year he would have been running away. Absolutely. In Garrett Wilson's class, he was probably he'd probably be wide receiver one as well. Like Kind of. He's up there, yeah. Because yeah, Drake London was the first receiver taken in that, and I think Roman Dunze is a better version of Drake London. <laughs> like, I, I think he, I think he's just a better version of Drake London. He's he's faster than him. I, again, the, the only, like, nitpicking thing I can even think of is he didn't have, like, a super diverse route tree at Washington, which, whatever, man. Like, I think I think it's it different. bigger than Thomas and Neighbors. It is bigger than than Thomas and Neighbors, absolutely. And I, 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 don't, I don't see the same, like, any kind of really red flags in him. It's funny because I, I was just, you know, looking up his, his scouting report here on uh, Brugler's, or Brugler's draft guide. And one of the only weaknesses he points out is just 60 career snaps on special teams. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because you're going to put your top 10 overall pick as a punt gunner. That makes right, sense. Right, which if that's a weakness for a guy that's considered a t- consensus top 10 pick, I don't think anybody's going to care. I'm, yeah, I mean, if, if Roman Dunze falls to 10, that's pretty much a best-case scenario, I'd like unless it's, you know, the best-case realistic-ish scenario, because I don't think he's there at 10. I think he probably is taken before 10, but it's definitely possible. Um, basically, I think there's a few guys where it's no-brainer. If they somehow fall to 10, you take them. Oh, we'll ignore the quarterbacks, but if Joe Alt's there at 10, you take him. If Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. somehow fall to 10, they're not going to. Some sort of but Laramie if, Tunsil incident happens. Right, but if they're there at 10, you take them. And I think Roman Dunze is the other guy. If he's there at 10, you don't even think about it. You absolutely run to the you know run to the podium and, and, and draft Roman Dunze. He's an incredible player. Uh, in terms of my draft board, I, like I – I wouldn't be upset if the Jets traded up to draft him. I'm dead serious. If they moved up to like seven or eight to draft the Dunze, gave up like a, you know, whatever it would take to get there. I'm not sure. Probably maybe a future couple picks, maybe a third. I don't, I don't, I don't think they want to give up their third this year to do that, but probably future picks. I'm cool with that because I'm confident Roman Dunze is going to be a great player. And now all of a sudden you got Garrett Wilson and Roman Dunze for the next hopefully decade. And they're both phenomenal receivers. Not, not to be Debbie Downer here, but the only reason I'm, kind of against trading up as I'm looking at all these, I know this is for quarterbacks, but the, the hot rumor lately is team, somebody's going to trade up probably Minnesota to get JJ McCarthy. Yeah. And I'm seeing the price that it's going for. I'm seeing like three firsts and or like two firsts and a second. And but like the price for trading up is so crazy inflated. Mm. Like uh, maybe it's, di- maybe it's different if they do it for a Dunze. I'm not necessarily sure, but because they would teams know that like Minnesota, you would be trading up for a quarterback and teams would know sure. that, but the price for going up even five, six spots is multiple picks into the future. And that's, yeah. that's a tough well, ask. I don't, I don't think the Jets should be trading up to five or six. The old, I, Look, if the Jets traded up to five and drafted Marvin Harrison Jr., I'm going to love it. I'm going to think that's the best thing in the world because I don't care what you have to give up. Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to be one of the best wide receivers in football. Tier all, he's he's tier all his own. For Dunze, yeah. it's a different conversation. I agree. I'm not trading up to, to five to draft Roman Dunze. But if they move up to eight, you know, move up two spots, I think it's different too because with a J.J. McCarthy trade up, there's going to be so much competition to try and trade up for that one spot, you know, because there's going to be a lot of teams looking at that quarterback. I'm not sure there's as much competition. So every pick is different. The value for every pick is different because it just depends on – you know, what the, what the market is, but 
yeah, I, I, I'm in favor of them trading up as long as it's not giving up a bunch of picks for a player that I don't think they should be doing that for. But if it's Harrison, Alts, or Neighbors, give up really legitimately whatever it takes to trade up. I'm happy with that. I want to go back to the offensive line debate because I'm actually not as big on picking an offensive lineman at 10 as a lot of Jets Twitter seems to be. Mm. Mostly because it seems like a lot of Jets Twitter is saying, well, you need to go draft, you know, Morgan Moses is old and hurt because he played through a shoulder thing and Tyron Smith is old and hurt. I'm like, yeah, let's cross that bridge when we come to it. Right. Because there's going to be good tackles pretty much every year. There's not going to be a year with no first round tackles in the NFL. The Jets are probably going to be able to spend some money next year. Like that's a 2025 problem. But if you want to get one at 10, because this is a good class for tackles, I feel like Olu Fashanu is the guy that you want because Alt's going to be gone. Fashanu's kind of slid. Like, like, I remember pretty much up until like December, he was OT1. Like, it was him and Alt. And then all of a sudden, Alt overtakes him. I think part of it too is Fashanu, the measurables weren't what everybody wanted to see. Like, he has really small hands. Mm hmm. And his hands are in a tier. I, this is going to sound weird, but offensive linemen with his hand size, if you look at linemen who've been picked high with that hand size, typically don't do well, which I could understand because you have to grab and move Miles Garrett, who's 275 pounds and really fast, with Kenny Pickett baby hands. So that could be a challenge. But if you want somebody who technically is very refined, who did not give up a single sack his sophomore year at Penn State, and he's handled Big Ten edge rushers, I think, fairly well. I think Fashanu is a pretty good bet. Like, actually, Gregory Freeman in chat brings up a good point where he said Becton was huge. How'd that work out? Fashanu, in a lot of ways, is kind of the opposite of Makai Becton in that he's a little bit smaller, a little bit more athletic, a lot more technically refined, because Becton was just pure power. Mm -hmm. And that was the only way that he was going to win. Now, with some of the offensive line moves the Jets have made, it might look a little weird to take Fashano because he seems like a shanahan kind of zone-blocking guy, and it looks like they're making a transition to a lot of gap blocking because that's what Tyron Smith was. That's what Morgan yeah. Moses was in Baltimore. Like It seems like they're actually making – and they got rid of Lake and Tomlinson. It seems like that's what they're doing. So Fashano would be kind of an older school Jets move. But if they want somebody who's good at handling – just more explosive rushers, who's a better pass blocker right now than I think a run blocker. I think Vashon is the guy. Yeah, I was gonna. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I was gonna say that too. I, I really like Vashon, obviously, and I think it's it's kind of. I don't know if it's weird that he's fallen. I think teams are just kind of more enamored by you know the shirt. Like I think Joe Alt is more of a quote unquote sure thing than Ola Vashon. I never really, in my mind, when I was diving in, put them in the same tier. But I think Fashan is absolutely a great player. He's a top 15 player in this class, and he's very likely to be a top 15 pick. Um, I'm glad you point up the brought up the the scheme fit thing, though, because the more I think about it, the more I think of guys like Fautanu and Fuaga being better fits for what the Jets are kind of doing with their offensive line, the the direction that they've gone in this offseason, bringing in guys like Morgan Moses and John Simpson from Baltimore and then Tyron Smith from Dallas – they're kind of more focused on those those gap those gap power run offensive linemen than the you know the more athletic zone blocking guys like a Fashanu. Uh, and I I don't I think that that's just you know that's a change in philosophy and I think it's it's gonna work well for the Jets and I think it works well with Brees Hall as well, which it makes it interest it makes Fashanu an interesting projection to the Jets. That said, if he's there at ten and they take him, I'm very happy with him and I'm very happy with that. I'm kind of at the point where, again, he's in a similar tier to Fautanu to me. I think I like Fautanu and Fashanu a little bit more than Fuaga, uh, mostly because Fuaga is probably a right tackle in the NFL. I don't know if the, he has that left tackle versatility. At least he didn't do it at Oregon State. Uh, and I think that there are some concerns more with him with with pass protection, like with Fashanu. I don't see those concerns of pass protection at all. In fact, I think he's already a very good pass protector, and I think he has the athleticism to get even better in that regard. He's still a work in progress probably as a run blocker, which – again, is a weird-ish scheme fit for what the Jets are going for because I think they're going for more of that power run uh, scheme with the with the offensive line. But he's got the potential to be a great player in the NFL. I think he's someone who can absolutely start day one. He probably wouldn't need to be starting day one with the Jets. But, you know, you mentioned it in the beginning, Tyron Smith hasn't played more than 13 games in the season since 2015. That's a decade ago, pretty much. Expecting Tyron Smith to play more than 13 games in 2024 is asking a lot. 
whatever, whoever, if you draft the tackle at 10, they are almost definitely going to play. So I don't think, I don't see it as a situation of, oh, you're drafting a backup. They're probably going to play more than Will McDonald did last year. So I wouldn't even, like, I wouldn't, that's not a consideration to me. I like Fashanu. I like the idea of drafting a tackle. I think my preference is still wide receiver over tackle, but you can't go wrong with either one, in my opinion. I think Fashanu is one of the best options at that position, for sure. For sure. And I think one thing that I have at least been pretty consistent on, I will say, from the get-go is even though the Jets have a pretty good tight end duo right now with Ruckert and Tyler Conklin, I think Brock Bowers is kind of in the – Brock Bowers from Georgia, the tight end, is in a tier almost by himself in terms of tight end prospects so far removed that I think he is the guy that they're going to end up picking a 10. I would not hate that move for one second. This is a weak tight end class, extremely weak. I would say mostly because there are exactly four really good prospects in this entire class. There are maybe four I would consider picking before day three. There's Ben Sanat from Kansas state. There's Theo Johnson from Penn state who we'll get into a little bit later, actually. A little wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Jatavian Sanders from Texas, and then Brock Bowers. Now, Bowers, I wouldn't say that he can't block. I mean, it's certainly not his forte. Like, I've seen people bring up comparisons to George Kittle a lot. Yeah, but Kittle's a better blocker than him. I For think sure. a better comparison might be Sam Laporta, who oh. – yeah. Had on what, like 900 yards as a rookie tight end for the Lions last year? Another Iowa guy, but I think Laporta was not as anywhere near as good a blocker as Kittle was. They'd almost make Kittle into a receiver. He was like a blocking guy. Everybody's a blocking guy at Iowa. They suck offensively, but that's where Kittle made his name, and then he became a good receiver. Bowers is not going to be a Gronk guy who's 265 and in line and blows guys away as a run block. He's just not going to do that. If you want your tight end to do that, He's not going to do that. Luckily, they have Conklin and Rucker, who are good blockers, especially Rucker. Maybe they make Rucker more like a fullback EH back thing, and then you just let Bowers run because this guy is 6'4, 241. He weighed in at, which some people were concerned he'd be under 240 for a tight end, but 241. And I've said this on the podcast before if you were just watching the tape and you did not know he was a tight end, you'd think he was a slot receiver. And you would not bat now. You go, oh, who's this 6'1, 190 pound guy? You're like, oh man, he's 6'4 and a half, 240. He's got maybe the best footwork as a receiver for a tight end I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Now, Kyle Pitts is the guy that he gets compared to a lot because Kyle Pitts went number four to Atlanta as a tight end. I think overall, as a prospect, Pitts is better because I think he had longer arms. I think he was more vertical. I think he was probably faster, just straight line, 40 yard dash. He was probably faster. But it's just really – if you can't get Brock Bowers on the field and get him involved in the passing game, like that's a you problem. That's a coordinator problem. You need to get rid of your guy because he's just such a natural progression. That's why I'm so high on Bowers because you can make him a Tyler Conklin upgrade. You can make him a slot receiver. You can can put him on the outside against cornerbacks. There's so many ways to use him. It's it's almost like in like an idiot proof way because there's risk with all these guys, but Bowers is as idiot proof a first round pick as I think you're gonna find at the skill positions outside of maybe Harrison and Neighbors that tier as you could find in this draft. So that's why I'm so high on him. I know some people have their debates about taking a tight end that high. Like tight end, it's getting to running back levels where people are just like, don't take a don't take a tight end that high. It's like don't take a running back that high. And I get all that, but there are exceptions. There are exceptions to these rules. Like, it's, oh, don't sign an older running back. Well, Derrick Henry's 30, and everybody wanted him. Like, there are exceptions. And I think Bowers is one of those guys. Yeah, I agree. I also agree with Kyle Pitts being a better tight end prospect. I think a lot of people are getting caught in a moment and saying that Bowers is a better prospect, and I disagree. I think that Bowers is an outs- like genuinely an outstanding athlete for his size. Like, one of the best athletic, most athletic tight ends we've seen in a while. And like you said, with his footwork and, and route running ability, I think that's an exceptional part of his game. And why even if you don't even use him a ton as an inline tight end because his blocking is fine. I think it's passable. I, I think it could get better. And obviously, if you're a Georgia tight end, you have to block a little. They're not going to play you if you can't block at all Georgia. 
but it's definitely not his strength. So even if you're just playing him a lot in the slot, like he is your extra playmaker. That 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 if you draft Brock Bowers, you can go into the year with Alan Lazard as your wide receiver three because he's really basically your wide receiver four at that point because you have Conklin and you have Bowers. I don't know if I'd say he's idiot proof because I'm just thinking of a scenario. Look, I know who the Jets' offensive coordinator is. The Jets' offensive coordinator is Nathaniel Hackett. I can absolutely see a scenario. In fact, I'm not sure there's any tight end prospect that is idiot proof. Even like a like a Travis Kelsey, I don't I don't think there's any tight end prospect that's idiot proof. As we've seen with how the Falcons have kind of misused Kyle Pitts over the last few years, I could very much see a scenario. He close to a thousand yards as a rookie though, or a second he year. He did, but it's still a situation where you know they they were throwing to to Johnu Smith a lot last year over Kyle Pitts. They were using Pitts a lot as a decoy. I'm pretty sure who was the third tight end? Was it Michael Pruitt or who was the? It was some. I forget they had to Mike Cole spelled M Y C O L E. Yeah. That's how I remember that. Yeah. But, but again, part of that too is he had Ritter, not Aaron Rodgers. So I, of course, of course. But and he also had you know Arthur Smith, who was not doing a great job with Atlanta, even though you know even if he did some good, good stuff. coordinator, bad coach over exactly his for sure. So I don't know if I'd say that Bowers is idiot proof. I could 100 percent see a scenario where the Jets draft Brock Bowers and absolutely misuse him because of who their offensive coordinator is, and you know I could see a scenario where they draft him and he's Tyler Conklin's backup and he's playing. 35%, 30 to 35% of snaps. And I don't think that that's what you want to do with a guy you're drafting at 10, at 10 overall, especially if he's as good of a prospect as Brock Bowers. I'd love it if they drafted him because of the the lack of idiot proof stuff. And because I, I don't think his ceiling is as high as the top three wide receivers in this class. Because of that, I like him less than those options. And honestly, if I was ranking them right now, I don't know if it's crazy to say. I think I'd prefer to have any of the top three receivers, of course. I think I'd probably prefer to have Olafushanu as well, and maybe Troy Fautanu, because I really like Fautanu. And I think he versatility wise, I think he'd just be so important to that team because they're gonna have injuries. That Fautanu will get on the field and he will play a lot as a rookie. I I think that would be better for the Jets because I'm also a Tyler Con- or Tyler Conklin stand. I think he's a really good player. And there's no reason you can't draft Brock Bowers and play them both. Absolutely you can, especially because Bowers doesn't even need to be playing tight end. You can just play him in a slot. That's fine. I think it restricts a little bit more of what you could do with the offense because if he's playing a slot, you're probably not moving Garrett Wilson there. And again, I also just really like Tyler Conklin. I think Tyler Conklin is a top 10 tight end in the NFL. I believe he's top 10 over the last two years in uh, receiving yards as well. And if I had to nitpick anything about Bauer's game that I think Conklin is a lot better than him at is that I don't think like the contested catches are there with Bowers. At least last year on his tape, I didn't see it as much. Um, he only caught two of his nine contested catch opportunities via well, PFF. It opened so easily. There's not that many contested catches. Right, but I'd like to see him be a little more dominant, you know, in, in those in those situations. And I, I think, obviously, again, I'm nitpicking here. He's a fantastic tight end prospect, one of the best tight end prospects we've seen in a while. I think there are elements to his game that are just like, they're not there yet, and maybe they will be there that kind of make me – I'll say this. I would much rather Brock Bowers at like 15 than 10. Uh, one, because you trade down and you you end up recouping hopefully a day two pick in the process. And two, because, well, also when we're talking about financial reasons, his contract will be smaller because if you're drafting him in the top 10, he's going to already be one of the highest paid tight ends in, in the NFL, which is kind of crazy to say, but I believe he'll be top 10 in cap hit if you draft him in the top 10. So that's something else to keep in, keep in mind as well. I like Bowers. I will not be upset if the Jets draft Brock Bowers. He's not my top option, but I'd be I'd be happy with him. I'm just looking at the order. You mentioned trading down to 15, so that would be Indianapolis moving up. Honestly, right. they might take him. They could. The Colts could absolutely trade up for Bowers. I would, would. Minnesota, Denver, probably quarterback, but in this class, I don't know if any of the top quarterbacks last that long. I think I've seen a lot of people saying Panix is is uh, his stock is rising. It'd be really. Oh, funny. That'd be a horrendous mistake. It would be hilarious because like there was a point where people were talking about him as a round one guy. Oh, Maybe. that's so foolish. If, that that no. no. How you really feel. I love Penix, except for the red flags. Like, except for I the have red him flags. on my big board, fifty seventh. All right. I mean, yeah, look, I have Spencer too, Rattler in like the seventies too. So that, he's closer statement. to Rattler than he is to like Nixon McCarthy. This is a silly statement, but if Penix was a little younger and didn't have the injury concerns, he'd be a top ten pick. That's a hey, dumb statement. Yeah, if yeah, <laughs> it's a dumb statement, but it is true. I love him as a player. If this and this and this happened, I'd be dating Charlize Theron. Well, it... <laughs> sure. Couple couple comments I want to get to uh, before we move on to our next segment. Uh, Brian Sternbeck, when talking about using Bowers, said, uh, "Jets play colors always 
ne- never tend to utilize rookies. Remember when Garrett Wilson barely played his debut game, Lawrence so the Jets Cager. can feature Lawrence Cager. Lawrence Cager. I actually thought he'd be. I actually liked him at Georgia. So another Georgia guy, Cager. But uh, Cager and, might be a better blocker than Bowers. <laughs> yeah. The, the thing about that, the thing I was concerned about last year to taking a skill position guy is not only that, but. Aaron Rodgers as typically like he expects a lot from his receivers in terms of being precise and knowing where you are. And I mean, if you don't, then you won't play and he won't throw you the ball. So I'm like, all right, I'd rather have veteran guys there, but this is before his leg blew up. So I'm like, all right, I'd rather have a veteran guy there than a rookie learning on the fly. But when you're in, when you're number 10 overall, like if they were 19 overall, I think that's a different conversation. 10 is such a unique opportunity in a draft where wide receivers are going earlier than ever and they're more valued than ever and you need like unless you have Patrick Mahomes who just breaks every rule like you need good wide receivers to do anything in this league now it's just the rules are tilting to that like that's why i think i'm so set on taking a skill position player at 10 like and Gregory Freeman who's been very active today in the chat shout out uh, Gregory Freeman he said if the Jets don't draft an offensive lineman in the first round, Joe Douglas should get fired. Which relax, relax. Right, yeah, that's a little strong. But also, if they again, if they were 18, 19, and all the top guys are gone, I'm like, you know what? Take a Marius Mims, take J.C. Latham, and then just move forward with how you're doing. I'd be fine with that. Mm. But 10, th- that's why there's so few good skill position players that are projected to go top 10 and then just catastrophically fall. You have to get a guy who can contribute right now at number 10. This is not a wait for a long time. That's what Gregory responded to me saying, relax. In 14 years and running, you relax. I'm tired of this crap. Look, I get it, Gregory. I understand. I'll say this, though. I do- Gre- Gregory, I just- we are the only fan-sided NFL site that has not covered a playoff game. Yes, and that's nuts, dude. This All of them have around. except us. We're, we're with you there, man. We support you. <laughs> this site has been around since I was in like middle school or junior high. Like That's ridiculous. That's so dumb. <laughs> That's dumb. That's it, 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 That shouldn't be the case. Wide receiver, like, I, again, I'm very happy if they go wide receiver, or, you know, full site playmaker, because we'll throw Bowers in there. I'm very happy if they go playmaker. I'll be happy if they go offensive line. I think you could absolutely make the case, and I think I would agree with the notion that playmaker is a more pressing need, at least for the starting lineup, than offensive line, because you don't have a wide receiver three right now. Your wide receiver three is Alan Lazard. That's a more pressing need, because you have your starting five offensive linemen. Again, Whoever you draft the 10 would probably end up playing anyway if they're an offensive lineman. But I think it's definitely not a stretch to say that playmaker is a more pressing need. So, no, obviously, Joe Douglas should not be fired if they don't draft an offensive lineman in the first round. Man, you guys are cool. He's got you Tyron Smith and Mike Williams, man. Right. You guys are short fuse here. And Hassan, Hassan Reddick? Like. And Hassan Reddick. <laughs> so, let's move on to day two because there's going to be – the Jets only have one day two pick this year. Uh, it's high in the third round. They traded their second round pick, of course, for Aaron Rodgers. But there are a lot of guys like Gr- Gregory, again, has been very high on Malachi Corley from yeah. uh, Western Kentucky. I like him. I think he's probably gone by the third round. He's a Debo Samuel light. I don't love how we basically only ran horizontal stuff where he kind of got the ball going horizontally. But very good athlete, very good hands. Wouldn't be opposed to it, but I don't think he lasts until – 72 overall. So I'm looking at 72 overall. I'm like, who? I believe it's 72. Or yeah, I think it's 71. Oh, good, good call for me. So I'm looking at that. I'm like, all right, let me look at both a playmaker and a lineman because I feel like they're either going to go playmaker round one, lineman round three, or vice versa. I feel like those are the two picks. Maybe they get a safety, but I don't know. So I'm looking at tight ends. And as you mentioned earlier, there's only – Four really good ones this year. Sorry, Cade Stover, he just missed out. And one of them is Theo Johnson at Penn State, who did not have the gaudiest numbers. Now, again, Penn State had kind of a weird passing offense. It basically only had Drew Aller throwing, like, short dump-off stuff, which is weird because he's a five-star recruit with a gigantic bazooka arm. But a lot of dump-offs, and that really hurt Johnson because he only had 34 catches for 341 yards. Seven touchdowns, but still. Then he goes to the combine and he's 6'6, 264, and he runs what, like a 4'7? And he grades out in terms of relative athletic score RAS. I believe he's like the third or fourth highest tight end in the history of RAS. Behind Zach that's, pr- that's pretty good. Behind Zach Koontz. Behind Zach Koontz. He's still, is he on the practice squad still? Well, he's with the technically on the active roster now, I guess, because there's no. Yeah, he will be on the practice squad. Okay, at least yeah. he's still in the organization. He, but... He's fighting with Kenny Aboa right now for tight end three. 
Well, they might be fighting with Theo Johnson soon because some people might have concerns with Bowers about blocking. Theo Johnson blocks his ass off for the entire game. Good hands, good route runner. Again, the, the production is not really what you want to see. I know you're drafting for tools most of the time, but 60 catches pretty much in all of college is not an amazing number. You probably want to see a little bit more than that. But in terms of just a ball of clay that you can mold into a good tight end if you don't take Bowers at one, I think Jatavian Sanders is probably A, going to be a round two guy, and B, he's almost a wide receiver. He can't block at all. Mm-hmm. So if you want the more complete tight end guy, I think Theo Johnson's your best uh, best bet for that. Excuse me. Yeah. I, I think he's definitely someone who's a work in progress, obviously. Not a lot of, you know, the, the college tape isn't, isn't extensive. He, I don't think he ever had 400 yards in the season. He was not super productive, but when he just blew up the combine six, six, whatever he is two sixty, and ran like a four or five, seven or whatever it was, uh, dude's a freak. He was an absolute freak. I don't freak. think you noticed. Right. Yeah. I, I don't think he's somebody that is going to, to, play a significant role early in his career but he's someone that you probably develop as a tight end two, probably tight end three with the jets um which is fine there's probably other ways i'd write i'd like the jets to spend a third round pick in a year that they're trying to to compete for the super bowl but i like him as a prospect as a developmental guy and i think he absolutely could find a, a home in the nfl with my day two guys i feel like we've talked about a lot of them and we've talked so much about the receivers in this class because it is such a freaking good receiver class like it is such a good receiver class and I want to talk about a guy that we, I don't think, have mentioned very much. Um, <clears throat> that's Ricky Pearsall from, from Florida. 6'1", 189, ran a 4-4-1, 40-yard dash at the Combine. Uh, former Arizona State player. I believe he was teammates with Brandon Ayuk there as well before transferring to Florida. Had and Jaden Daniels. He was his guy and, for most of the And, of course, Jaden Daniels, of course, before he transferred to LSU. Uh, led Florida in receiving in each of the last two seasons, but he never had 1,000 yards in a year. Florida's offense, you know, wasn't the best. They're definitely their passing game. Wasn't Anthony great. Richardson had yeah. to do superhuman things just to complete like an eight yard pass. Right. Exactly. Um, but I really like Pearsall as, as a, as a, as a player and as a prospect, I don't think he's like, I don't think his, his speed shows up quite as much on tape. I think he's more of a straight line guy, but really good route running uh, really, really good tracking skills. I think down the field. And I think that's probably what you're, you're, most impressed by i think some teams probably see him as more of a slot guy and i believe he played more of the slot at florida as well um but he's a he's, he is versatile enough to 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 do both uh i really like ricky pearsall as a potential day two pick i think he's probably gonna go maybe in that like second or third round range i don't think he, he gets past day two uh at this stage but really good footwork really good play speed i i think he's just a very good prospect uh and just one of the many amazing day two receiver prospects we've talked a lot about a lot of them guys like roman wilson i mean i don't know if xavier worthy gets the day two at this point but he's in there my guy lad mcconkey there are xavier Leggett. there's so many keon coleman. keon coleman not as high on keon coleman but he's definitely one of those guys in that day two range there's so many and i just wanted to shout out pierce because we haven't really talked about him very much pierce just has the look of a guy who just for his entire career is going to be 60 catches, 700 yards, six touchdowns. Yeah. But every year, year in and year out, he just consistency every single mm-hmm. year. He reminded me a little bit of Josh Reynolds. Oh, okay. I, I He's like got that. that slender body type who can go downfield, kind of a rep, like quick route run. That's why McVay liked him. That's why the yeah. Rams took him. He just kind of has that look to him. I don't think he's as big as Reynolds, but – I he think I'm not 100% he's, sure. He's got like that that Kenny Stills deep tracking ability too. Like where you Stills could do was faster though. Stills was, was more like a track guy. He was, but I think you can like when in terms of like his deep route running ability and, and ability to, to to track the ball down the field. I, I can see it. I think that's going to be a strength of his in the NFL for sure. And then we were I'm looking also at another day three guy because we were just talking about Troy Fatanu. Day two, day two. Day two, excuse me. Troy <laughs> Fatanu. I got to correct myself now, especially as – a guy who gets a little granular about pronouncing people's names right, Fautanu. Okay. Another guy who caught my eye. That Washington team was loaded, man. So I feel good. bad for Kalen DeBoer, too, because he went to Alabama to replace Saban, and literally all of his assistants left, and mm. he brought his OC, and then he went to go join the Seahawks. I'm like, man, I feel really bad for him, man, because he didn't get a lot of his recruits. But that was such a loaded team. Because not only do they have a good left tackle, Fautanu, but their right tackle was Roger Rosengarten. And he's a guy – I thought I was higher on him than most when I put him as like the 82nd, I think, player on my big board, it's somewhere close to that, like that kind of mid-third round range. I'm like, I, I really like this guy. Then Mel Kuyper puts him at 31. I'm like, whoa. 
I guess I guess the secret's out on Roger Rosengarten, but kind of he's almost kind of the opposite of Fautano in a good way though, where he's very technically refined, good hand placement. Like like you'd want to just take pictures of him and put him in a textbook or like an instructional DVD. Like here's how you play right tackle. Good mm-hmm. choppy footwork, good long run. I don't love his athletic ability. It's just like okay, it's just passable. And I feel like there he was really lacking as a run blocker at times. Like there were times where he got kind of pushed back a little bit as a run blocker, and they ran mostly to Fautanu's side when they did run with Dylan Johnson. They didn't really go to him, but technically there's a lot to like about him. Now, if you could just work on kind of splicing some of Fautanu's aggressiveness and Dr. Moreau Frankenstein putting it in his brain, I think you're going to have a really good prospect and a potential more of a true right tackle who could eventually succeed Morgan Moses. And you get an extra year to just throw him behind Moses, learn, and then you go into the offseason saying, all right, either Roger Rosengarten will be ready or we can spend money on the right tackle. So I think that's pretty advantageous. Yeah, like you said, that Washington team was absolutely stacked, especially specifically that offense was just ridiculous. I mean, they have three receivers who might go in the first two days. They have two offensive tackles who are probably going to go in the first two days. It's crazy. I think Rosengarten – And Excel, Dylan Johnson might get picked too. Right, yeah, and, and I think Rosengarten kind of gets overlooked for that reason. Played, I believe, exclusively right tackle in college. I think he, he had some practice at left tackle, but only, I believe, played right tackle in games. Technically sound guy. I don't think you see, like, the the nastiness or whatever, the mauling ability that you'd like. Like you mentioned, I think he, he lacks a little bit as a run blocker, but very sound right tackle prospect. I think he's definitely someone who can – who can honestly, I think he can compete for a starting job early in his career. Probably wouldn't with the Jets, but he's definitely someone you can draft, potentially succeed Morgan Moses as your right tackle. I think he just needs to, I don't even know about get stronger, just kind of play with a meaner mindset, if that makes sense, which sounds like a really silly analysis, but that's kind of the, the vibe that I get from watching him. I think he's good in pass protection. I think he's fine. I just don't see like, he, he's not a finisher. He's not a Taliesi Fuaga in that regard. It's very different tape when you're watching those two players. Um, I'm going to talk about another receiver in a bit, but I'll, I'll throw out another offensive lineman here because like you said, Mike, I think that it's very likely that the Jets go either wide receiver day one and an offensive lineman day two or vice versa. I'll talk about a player who I believe you mentioned when we were talking about the senior bowl a little bit ago, but that was a while ago. Uh, talking about Dominic Pooney from Kansas, older prospect. He already turned 24 because they believe he was a D2 transfer. I think he played some, some ball at D2 before going to Kansas the last two years. A very versatile prospect. Started at both left guard and left tackle for Kansas. I believe he has experience at right tackle as well. And I think that versatility is going to be huge for a team like the Jets that they just need depth around that offensive line because, you know, I, I like Carter Warren, I guess, a little bit. I like, you know, Wes Schweitzer. He's a fine backup, but they really just need depth because there are genuine injury concerns with guys like Tyron Smith, Elijah Bear Tucker, and even Morgan Moses is coming off that shoulder injury. Uh, Dominic Pony started two years at Kansas. I think that he is a, a you know, the versatility is 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 huge with him. Um, excuse me. I think he is, you know, more of that. He's got more of that meaner mindset to him that, like, power, more of a, a raw power guy than a guy like Rosengarten. Uh, probably projects better at guard in the NFL, if I was to say. Uh, he's got good length. Like, he's, he's 6'5", 313, I think. His arm length isn't bad by any means. But probably would be better off as a guard. I don't think – I don't know if he can handle, like, true uh, – speedier you know or, or more athletic edge rushers in the nfl but somebody that i think you draft and, and develop as a guy who can immediately provide depth and maybe develop into a starter that'd be fine with me in, in the third round probably second round if the jets were to trade back and get a second round pick might be a little high for him but i really like him in that like round three maybe even round four range i'm looking to i want to get to another question from uh southern jet on twitter before we move into our day three Stevens. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like UNC wide receiver Tez Walker. Yeah. And he helped ease Mike Williams into back to 100%. We've discussed Tez Walker yeah. in the past. Uh, he reminds me of a, a Kenny Stills type, but bigger in that mm-hmm. speed guy, vertical, go and get the ball. Like, like back in the day, you ever go look at old football stats? And you're like, how did this guy average 23 yards a catch yeah. in the 1970s? Is all they had him do was go deep like that. He's not as fast as this guy, but like a Cliff Branch type. You know, Wesley, uh, Wesley, Wesley Anderson. Walker. Wesley Walker, Wesley Walker to a degree, like he's that. It's that sort of build. Now the concern, obviously, is how often are you going to go deep, and how often are you going to run more frequent, for lack of a better word, NFL routes. Mm-hmm. Not as good at it. Plus, you're really banking on his year at North Carolina, where he only played 
seven, eight games. Not his fault. He got totally screwed because of NCAA transfer yep. logistics, but not his fault. But there's really not a ton of high level tape for him. It's a lot of Kent State stuff. Hey, 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 hey. Shout out Kent State. Don't, don't, don't be dissing the Golden Flashes. Don't diss the Golden Flashes where I damn well please. Don't you dare diss the Golden Flashes. Shout out uh, former head coach Sean Lewis. I believe he was the head coach when, uh, when Devontae Walker was there. Now he's at San Diego State, I believe. He he, is. Yeah, I think he was. He came from Syracuse. He was the OC for Deion Sanders, and he got like fired or like mm -hmm. took the play calling away from him like five days in, which is dumb for me because his defense sucked, and that was the problem. But that's a different conversation. Right. As Walker is a guy that I would like getting. Like he's more of a Mike Williams replacement, but I feel like the Jets might want like Brian Thomas is a better route runner, so he gives you the route running and the verticality. Walker only gives you the speed and the verticality right now, so mm -hmm. he'd be a little raw. I don't know if he'd be a great like year one contributor if that's what the jets want yeah I, I i like i mean look i watched him at kent state i am a very 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 casual kent state fan i think i've mentioned this on the podcast before only because i had an ncaa 14 dynasty with them and i i won a national championship in like 2033 or something with them so shout out kent state shout out golden flashes he was an awesome player at kent state and i, I do remember watching some of his highlight reel i mean like damn this dude's pretty good um, didn't really get to watch too much of him in North Carolina last year, but yeah, he's, he's definitely a, a downfield threat. He ran a four, three, six, 40 yard dash, super fast guy. I'd be happy with him. Uh, I'd be happy with him as a day two guy for sure. So moving on to our final segment of the show, we're going to go to day three guys, a guy who might be picked fifth, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round late in the draft. You're going to think, ah, he's just a, one of the guys, he's just cannon fodder. He's a camp body, but this guy's different. And he might actually carve out a role. And I'm going to look at a quarterback. And we've discussed some of the later quarterbacks in this draft. You know, Jordan Travis and Joe Milton and Michael Pratt from Tulane. Seems like he's going to be the best of the day three guys. But I went really deep in and I found Devin Leary from Kentucky, who actually is a local guy because he was born in yeah. Sicklerville and he went to high school in Gloucester Township at Timber Creek. Sure. So yeah, go Chargers. Crazy. That's South Jersey. So Leary's kind of a weird guy. I guess he has this insane year at NC State in 2021 where he completes 66% of his passes and he throws 35 touchdowns against five picks. Mm. Tremendous year. Then he gets banged up, only starts like maybe six, seven games for NC State, transfers to Kentucky, and his completion percentage dropped from 65 to 56. Mm. And 2,800 yards, 25 touchdowns, 12 picks. So not as good a year. So I'm like, all right, the entire key to Leary and his entire skill as a prospect, his entire stock, for lack of a better word, is all going to be about how much that 2021 year is the real him and how many, how many coaches think that they can get it out of him. And I'm watching Kentucky, and I'm like, you know what? It's fairly obvious that if you put him in the right situation, you can get a lot out of him because, as you saw, like last year when I was watching Will Levis, I didn't think Will Levis was going to be like a top 10 pick, but I liked his arm and I liked some of the stuff here. I liked him more than like McCarthy this year. I'm like, man, they are just giving this guy nothing. They have no line. It's a very basic offense. They have one receiver who catches half the passes. I'm like, this isn't good at all. And they kept a lot of that this year. I mean, he had no line. He didn't really have receivers. He had Ray Davis, a good running back. But in the passing game, that's, they didn't really have much. And he was still able to make plays on the move. He's not a big guy. He's like 6'1", maybe 2'10", but – He's got that kind of baseball player whippy arm where you can just contort it and fire it into weird angles. Like it's it's always funny to me how guys can just be six foot one ninety and gun a baseball, and then a guy could be six five two forty and throw like a softball. Leary's got that very elastic arm. You want him to go downfield? Hell yeah, he can go downfield. He just when he gets time. Now, obviously, when he's when he gets panicked, there's obviously problems. But everybody has problems when they get panicked. And also, like, the arm is good. It's good. But it's not great, so I think that will knock him down a little bit. But if you want to just take a day three developmental prospect, a lot worse than you can do than Devin Leary. Because that 2021 NC State year where he was so great, I think that's still in there. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it before. With any day three quarterback prospect, there's going to be obvious serious flaws. Because if they were, if they didn't have these flaws, they wouldn't be going day three, especially if they're a quarterback. Leary, the flaws are obvious. I mean, one, he turns 25, I believe, in September. So he's already – 10th, yes. Yeah, so yeah. older guy, too. He's already – right. So he's already a very old prospect. He played like four or five years at NC State before he transferred. Um, but, yeah, that 2021 season, I think a lot of teams are going to look at and be like, how can we possibly replicate this? Because 
His tape at Kentucky last year was not great, like very inconsistent accuracy. I think that specifically throwing outside the numbers was really a problem for him. Um, and also kind of, I feel like, again, he, I think I said this about somebody else, but he struggles with Baker Mayfield system or sy syndrome where he doesn't know how to not throw at 95 miles per hour. Like he just kind of zips it in there all the time. And it's weird with his, his throwing motion is so weird. Um, but I, I think that that's definitely, you know, that's definitely a problem with him, but got a really good arm. I honestly, I don't, I also don't think that he's like, he's not a statue back there. Like this isn't, he's not a Carter Bradley. It's it, athleticism is never going to be his strength, but he can extend plays. He can create out of schedule, which is something that you want to look for from a day three quarterback prospect that has some kind of developmental upside. But I, I you know, again, he's a day three quarterback prospect. I don't expect much of him at the NFL level. And the fact that he's older makes his developmental upside a little bit lower, but you saw what he did in 2021 with NC State. I think there was some things to like about what he did last year with Kentucky, even if the, you know, the turnovers were a big problem, not only interceptions, but I believe he has he has pretty significant fumble issues as well throughout his college career. So those will obviously have to come down. But sure, as a day three guy, it's fine. I think I'd still prefer like a Michael Pratt, maybe, or like a Jordan Travis. I think those are more more maybe even more likely for the Jets to go that route. But Devin Lear is fine. If they took him round five, even round six, cool. I'd be I'd be fine with that. Uh, the guy I'm going to talk about, and it's I wanted to focus on a running back. And my favorite day three running back is a player that I believe I talked about last week or, or very recently, and that's Audrick Estime. So I'm not going to talk about him again because we've already we've already talked about him. But another guy I really like, and somebody who I think has the has a potential to be a lot better of a pro player than he was in college, and that's Isaac Garendo out of Louisville. He wasn't even Louisville's number one running back last year. Jawar Jordan he, was. Yes, that was Jawar Jordan, and he he was their their leading rusher. He was their you know starting running back or whatever. Um, so it's very interesting to talk about this guy. I like him a lot better than Jordan as a prospect, and I think a lot of other a lot of NFL teams will agree. He's already he turns twenty four in June, but he does not have a lot of mileage on his his you know his his tires his legs or yeah thank you uh That's he does not have a lot of carries in his career he transferred from wisconsin uh to louisville this past season he never had more than he only had over more than 100 carries this one season he didn't he was barely used before that it was more of just kind of a rotational guy six foot 221 and he ran a 4 3 3 40 yard dash and i think when he did that at the combine a lot of teams kind of sat up and were like oh shoot he can He's, he's got that speed, too, because I don't think that speed necessarily shows up on tape as much. I think when he gets in open space, it does. He's more of like a straight line guy. And I think that's, you know, one of the things you got to keep in mind when you look at his size speed blend. And you're like, oh, my goodness, how is this guy not, you know, a, a top 50 guy? Uh, and that's why. Um, I think he's at his best once he kind of just builds up and gets going. But the reason that I love him so much as a prospect, too, is because I think he's a really good pass catcher and a really good pass blocker. Um, which, you know, in Wisconsin, they, they definitely instill that in their running backs. A lot of Wisconsin running backs coming out tend to be pretty good run blocker or pass blockers. And I don't think Garendo is, is any different. Um, I think he's somebody that can come in and fill a role for the Jets. You know, again, I, I think I prefer Estime for that role as that more short yardage guy. I don't know if Garendo is necessarily that kind of a player. Obviously, he's faster. They tried like, to do that a little bit, but it, yeah. it seemed like they just went with the hot hand most of the time at Louisville. Right. Him and Jordan were an interesting blend uh, uh, together, but I, I do really like him as a prospect. I think he's someone who absolutely can be a much better player and much more productive player in the NFL. And despite his age, and normally you want to stay away from older running back prospects, it's really just, it, tend, it, it comes down to how many carries you have. Like, look at a guy like Raheem Moster. He's 30 31 and playing the best football of his career because he barely played early in his career meanwhile a guy like dalvin cook was washed by 27 because he was running to the ground so i don't really look at the age as much as how much mileage you got in your tires garendo does not have a lot of mileage on his tires and i think that he can be a very good player in the nfl not my favorite day three running back prospect but definitely one of my top options if the jets go that route plus also I believe he, was a, he was a former track guy too so there's there the speed go. I was about to say the concern would be that he would be a little Theo Johnson, which is my fear with him, which is how yeah. much of it is just underwear Olympics and how much of it's actually going to translate to football mm -hmm. as opposed to wearing, you know, skin tight pants or running in the air conditioned. What is it now? The, not the Edward Jones dome. That's St. Louis Lucas oil. That's, oh, yeah. that's the Colts play. Yes. The Edward Jones dome. Well, I've been, look at this old geriatric grandpa talking about the St. Louis is. Rams. I don't even know what that is. I've never that's that. where the Rams played. Oh, okay. In St. Louis. Cool. Know your history. <laughs> I shouted at Wesley Walker before. Right? I'm like, I know my, my jet. I know my history. You you are an encyclopedia of football knowledge. They, they, they just packed it up for the, uh, what were they, the Battle Hawks? 
Yeah, St. Louis. That place was oh. 40,000 people. Oh, that's, that's right. That's right. Okay. That's St. Think, Louis, a team, man. Yeah, it's a great city. Jeez. So now that we're talking about St. Louis, I think it's time to call time on this episode of the Jet Press, talking about the New sure. York Jets. My two guys, one guy who's from Jersey and Pennsylvania, another guy from Long Island. Let's get rid of the St. Louis talk. And let's just say thank you guys for tuning in. As always, you can find us on Apple, Spotify, Overcast, wherever you get your podcasts, or on all those sites, YouTube, at the Jet Press, subscriptions, likes. They all really help. Justin, take us home. I want to quickly shout out, because I was going to mention him as another day three guy, but I didn't get a chance to. Shout out Cole Burgess from SUNY Cortland. My, uh, I, I was going to say my alumni, but I'm an alumni of, or alumnus of <laughs> Portland, whatever, my alma mater. That's the word. Shout out Cole Burgess. I believe he made. I don't, I don't know what the value of a Cortland degree then is if you couldn't get alma mater from. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> First you take a shot at Kent State. Now you're taking a shot at Cortland. I'll take a shot at Sienna because I went to Marist. Do you know That's how you get a Sienna grad off your doorstep? Is that a, is this a, how do you do it? Is this a joke? What is, I'm confused. You pay for your pizza. I don't even understand that joke. I don't even, is that because the Sienna grads working as the pizza delivery guy? Dude. Oh, oh, okay, good one. That was really funny. Again, Portland <laughs> coming in. I don't know. <laughs> Look, Cole Burgess, six foot, one ninety two, <laughs> ran a four four five. He has a chance to get drafted, and if he's not drafted, or if he is drafted, the Jet. You know what? That's who I want. When the Jets are on the board, Mister Irrelevant. If it's not Cole Burgess from SUNY Cortland, I will be upset. Unless they sign him as an undrafted agent, then I'll be happy again. But that's that's fine. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, until next maybe, time. Also, maybe he'll make because the only time I, when I was at Maris, we had only one guy. I remember his name was Justin Christian, and he sure. signed as an undrafted free agent with the Ravens because he was from there. And I don't think he obviously didn't make it. I think he went to the, the Calgary Stampeders for a bit, but okay. I believe he led the country in yards per catches last year. He was really fast. So there was a Cortland guy, Jake Ceresna. I believe he made it to the NFL or he, he signed, he was at the training camp with the Jets. I think he might've been with the Patriots. I forget, but Cole Burgess is legit. Shout out D three national champs, Cortland red dragons. Let's go. Also keep an eye out on the channel. We might have some draft interviews coming up, up coming up over the next two weeks. We had a lot of those last year. It was really fun. Cause we got to speak with Jark Bernard Converse like a week and a half before the draft. And then he ended up getting drafted by the Jets. So there's a very decent chance that that might happen again. We'll hopefully have a few of those going up on the channel. Probably have more updates next week on that. Might even have some before then. We'll see. Uh, but until then and until next time, thank you all for joining us on the show today. You can follow Mike on Twitter at by Mike Luciano. Follow me on Twitter at Justin T. Free. Follow the Jeff Press at the Jeff Press. Download the Jeff Press podcast wherever you get your podcast. Check us out on YouTube and TikTok. Subscribe, like, hit that notification bell. You guys know what to do. We stream live every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you all for listening to Jet Press Podcast. I have been Justin Freed. That has been Mike Luciano. We'll see you guys next time. See you folks next week as the draft keeps coming closer. <laughs>